Hey guys and welcome to Respect Your Intellect. I'm John and in this video we'll be talking about climate change and the effect that global warming has on our planet and our society. Let's get started. Alright, so the history of climate change in the scientific field is a long one, so we'll put the milestones on the timeline so that it's easier to see where we're coming from on this topic. To start off, before the 18th century, no one thought the prehistoric climates were any different than the modern period. But by the late 18th century, geologists had found evidence of changing climates by finding signs of past glaciers in places that were too warm for glaciers in modern times. So this is our starting point. The 19th century is when we first discovered that humans were contributing to the change in climate. It started in 1815 when Jean-Pierre Perraudin first proposed that the Earth had undergone an ice age, where glaciers covered more, uh, Europe and most of North America. Some didn't even find this theory worth exploring at all at first, but after very heavy skepticism was eventually deemed to have merit. In 1824, Joseph Fourier discovered that Earth's atmosphere was responsible for keeping the planet warmer than it would be in the vacuum of space. Then in the 1870s, the Ice Age theory finally became widely accepted. And finally, in 1896, the first calculations were performed that showed that cutting down carbon dioxide by half would produce another Ice Age, and that doubling the carbon dioxide would increase the global climate by 5 to 6 degrees. Since carbon production was low at the time, it was believed that it would take thousands of years to warm the planet, and that it might even be beneficial to humanity. Between 1900 and 1950, the main advances came from observations that showed ancient climates. We did this by examining annual layers of sediments of clay, and examining tree rings. Tree rings, though, were not accepted for climate study until the 1960s, since other scientists initially thought that they would most likely not show anything beyond a regional climate. In the 1960s, the warming effect of carbon dioxide gas became increasingly convincing and concerning. During the 1970s, scientific opinion increasingly favored the warming viewpoint and increasingly predicted warming. In the 1980s, a consensus began to form, and in 1988, James E. Hansen made the first assessment that humans already had an impact on global warming. By the 1990s, a consensus position was formed. Greenhouse gases are deeply involved in most climate changes, and human-caused emissions were causing noticeable global warming. Since the 1990s, scientific research on climate change expanded to include oceanic processes, plants, variations in solar radiation received by Earth, plate tectonics and volcanic eruptions, and human-induced alterations of the natural world, which currently has the greatest effect in global warming. So this is the history of global warming from the beginning to now. Here's a quick overview of the main factors that indicate a warming planet. There are 10 main indicators in total that show a warming world. With global warming, we get more humidity, we get higher temperatures in the ocean's surface and in the air above oceans and land. We also get a decrease in sea ice, glaciers, and snow cover. As you can see here, every indicator points towards global warming. And if this continues, we would reach the highest global temperature of the last 740,000 years by the year 2100. Now that we have a consensus and that a lot of things are already underway to help limit global warming, we're studying more of the effects and trying to figure out more solutions at this point. So here are some of the negative effects from global warming that we know today. The sea level rise is accelerating and comes from melting glaciers and expansion of water due to heat. We'll have longer and more intense heat waves and can already be observed by the increasing amount of large forest wildfires. Plants and animals already had to move. Trees are blooming sooner. As the ocean soaks up CO2, oxygen could become depleted and affect marine life. Agriculture and food production around the world could be very negatively impacted. Economical repercussions are projected to only worsen. There will be a decrease in global freshwater reserves as our freshwater mixes increasingly with salt water. Humans will need to migrate, which will cause a ton of problems, possibly including military conflicts. We'll have more precipitation and flooding from the increased humidity. We'll have more extreme weather. We'll have more health problems from pollution 
longer allergy seasons and more diseases from insects that will now have a greater range. Our electricity infrastructure will be at risk from the growing consequences of global warming. And there are even more possibilities which are still poorly understood at this point. The process of global warming is also known to be something that is accelerating because of positive feedback loops. For example, as glaciers melt, less of the light received uh, by Earth will be reflected back into space. So we'll be retaining more of the heat, making the glaciers melt faster still. Also, Oceans are currently absorbing a lot of the CO2, but as they become more saturated, they become less capable of doing that over time. Now, there's something called the runaway greenhouse effect. This is a point of no return, where the planet will continue to get warmer and warmer until it becomes an inferno. Venus had a lot of similarities with Earth and did go through this process. It's very often given as an example of what could happen here on Earth. The reality, though, is that we're talking about a few degrees here. It'll have much more devastating implications on humanity than positive ones, but we can't get completely carried away either. The fact is that we've had much warmer periods on Earth in the past, but there was no indication of a, a runaway greenhouse effect back then. So for now, it seems very unlikely that Earth would become like Venus, but if it ever does, it will more likely be over hundreds of millions of years. What could still happen though is that we could render a lot of the planet inhabitable by humans, even without a runaway greenhouse effect. I'll link to an article on National Geographic that shows the new coastlines for all continents if the sea level rose a few hundred feet as it very well could. This would cause a human migration that would come at an extreme economic cost and cause many conflicts and disruptions around the world, and overpopulation would also become an even greater concern than it is now. Now, here's where global warming disagreements usually happen when we determine if it's humanity's fault that this is happening. As we stated previously on the timeline, the first assessment that humans had an impact was made 30 years ago in 1988. Some of you might not even have been born yet, so the scientific community had a lot of time to research this topic very closely and thoroughly and let the entire community try to re refute their findings. Huh? Today, we have a consensus on the fact that the planet is warming and a 97-98% consensus on humans being responsible for the current warming. This fluctuates a little based on the source of the studies, but not by more than a few points. Even the studies showing the lowest numbers are still above 90% consensus that humans are responsible for the current warming of the planet. If you already did some research of your own on the topic, you might have come across the fact that human carbon emissions are only a tiny fraction of natural processes. If you're still reluctant to accept that humans are causing global warming, this might be why. Well, the fact that human emissions are only a tiny fraction is true. The problem though is not that we're emitting more carbon than nature, it's that we're changing the natural equilibrium, making it worse year over year. Vegetation, land and oceans are constantly going through an exchange of CO2. The oceans emit and absorb about 330 to 340 gigatons. Land and vegetation emit and absorb 440 to 450 gigatons. And we only emit about 30 gigatons. Even though this is a small figure, only about 40% of the carbon we emit can get absorbed, while the remaining 60% goes into our atmosphere. As long as we keep adding CO2, we, uh, that can be absorbed, the world will continue to rise in temperature. If you're still in doubt, there's another way that we can tell humans are responsible apart from the careful calculations uh, of the emissions that we produce since the Industrial Revolution. The way we know we're responsible is by looking at the isotopes of carbon in the atmosphere. So carbon has three different isotopes, carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. Carbon-12 is the most common, carbon-13 makes up about 1% of total, and 14 is just about one per trillion. All of them behave the exact same way in chemical reactions, so the only difference between them is that they have a slightly different mass. Carbon-12 is the lightest, while carbon-14 is the heaviest. Carbon-14 is also unstable and decays over time. When it comes to living things, there's also a strong preference for the lighter carbon-12 isotope. When we look at the ratios of isotopes in the atmosphere of the past, such as when we use tree rings or layers of ice, we find that ratios are pretty stable up until about 150 years ago. At that point, not only did CO2 increase from 280 parts per million to 400 parts per million, 
but the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-13 also changed dramatically. Carbon-12 began to increase at the same time as the Industrial Revolution happened and must be coming from something outside of natural sources. The reason why carbon-12 began to increase is because of fossil fuels, which comes from plants. Since plants are a living thing and have a strong preference for the lighter carbon-12 isotope, Fossil fuels are almost entirely made up of carbon-12. When we burn fossil fuels, we're essentially putting all this carbon-12 back into our atmosphere and changing the ratio. We've tried to look at other possible sources for this change in ratio, but we haven't been able to find anything in decades of searching something else to blame. This is why almost 98% of scientists agree that climate change is caused by humans burning fossil fuels. So now, in order to limit the damage, we have to continue our efforts to minimize our emissions and help our planet as much as we can. So here are some of the things that we can do to help this situation. We can invest in renewable energy like solar, wind, and geothermal. We can avoid wasting energy by using better building insulation. We can invest in energy efficient appliances and light bulbs. We can reduce water and food waste. We can unplug unused devices and stop wasting idle energy. And we can drive electric or fuel efficient vehicles with well inflated tires to improve gas efficiency even further. Up to now we've already passed the one degree celsius mark but as of yet the impact has been pretty minimal the big problem stems from the fact that we have to start taking action right now in order to limit global warming to less than two degrees celsius huh? initially we hope to limit to 1.5 degrees but we've already passed this mark however trying to keep it as low as possible will be a lot easier on our economy and humanity as a whole it's been calculated that the difference between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees could cost us around 30 trillion dollars. In order to limit global warming to stay as close to 1.5 degrees as possible, we need to make extreme changes as of right now and there's no time to lose. We need to start cutting emissions but instead even if some countries make good progress, 2017 was still a new record high. We need to have a 45% worldwide reduction in emissions by 2030 and net zero emissions by 2050. Since we're already past the point where we can limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, we'll need to also deploy anti-emission technologies. The problem with those right now though is that we're still not aware of how effective they would be or if they're safe enough for the environment. The good news though is that an increasing amount of people, businesses and governments are becoming aware and taking measures to ensure we move towards the goal. All we need to do right now is accelerate the solutions that are already in place and continue to try to implement other solutions as best we can or come up with new ones. The smaller things will add up too so we can all definitely do our part. If you like this video please hit the like button and if you want more content like this please subscribe and hit the little bell. If you have any suggestions about what you'd like to talk about put it down in the comments below or come follow me on Twitter or Facebook Links are in the description. Until next time, thanks for watching and remember, respect your intellect.